All right, so far, just kind of dragging sliders around and seeing what sticks, this numerical approach to trying to find a curve of best fit. Um, you know, it's a, bit, it's a bit like throwing a whole bunch of numbers up against a wall and seeing what sticks. Um, it's, there are methods to do that smartly in mathematics sometimes. They're called Monte Carlo methods. Um, so we could treat this like it's a calculus problem and set up a function that takes as its two inputs your parameters m and b and try to do an optimization problem and tells us how to minimize this squared, this total squared error um, by choosing an appropriate m and a b. But the theme of our course so far has been minimization problems that look like calculus are really just hidden linear algebra, linear algebra behind the scenes. So what I want to do is look at, in my example, how to transform the question of which combination of the functions square root of x and 2 to the x gets me the closest to a function which passes through all three of these points? That's really the question that we're meant to answer. Which function, which is a combination, a linear combination of square root of x and 2 to the x, gets us the closest to a function which passes through all of these three points? So framing it in that way makes it sound an awful lot like a projection problem. So here's the kind of projection problem that it turns out to be. So our projection problems so far have taken the form of we choose a subspace, a linear subspace. We have some point which is not on that subspace. Call it B or something like that. And then we have to find the closest element on our subspace to the point B. We call that element the projection of B onto S. <clears throat> so this is P of B, or something like that, right? And the motivating principle behind all of it is orthogonality, that the line joining B to that subspace should be perpendicular to that subspace. Well, rather than taking the high-minded approach to this, I want to just get down into the weeds, into the nuts and bolts of what it would take to find some combination, some function y, which is equal to, I'm going to call it c1, a coefficient, times the square root of x, plus c2, some possibly different coefficient, times 2 to the x. I want to find which function that looks like this gets me the closest to passing through my three points. Now, my three points here happen to have different co uh, coordinates than yours. I have 0, 1, 1, 1, and 2, 3. I changed mine just a little bit um, because I have a square root, and so my square root's never going to get me close to something which has a negative x value. How did I choose these two functions? I was sitting around in mass services this morning and thinking, what sounds good? Um, that's all. Um, probably somebody who's doing this for practitioner purposes um, has a more particular goal in mind. Um, you might decide to choose the sine of x or sine of pi x or something like group 4 had because you expect that there's some sort of periodic behavior in your data that you're looking for. You might choose an exponential as team 3 had because you expect that your data is modeling some exponentially growing or decaying behavior, right? So there may be some practical purposes behind what uh, basis functions that we choose to do this process with. Um, but in my example, it was just a whim. And the power of this is it doesn't matter. The method doesn't care. No matter what you feed it, it's going to find you that closest function from among the ones that you chose, from among the family of functions that you chose. So we're starting out with this, what I call a model, function model, which really defines for us an entire space, an entire vector space full of functions. So this is an element of a vector space, which I'll call f, script f, which is just the set of all a times radical x plus b times 2 to the x, where a and b range over all real numbers. And you can show that that is, in fact, a vector space. I can add two of those type of functions together and get another of those type of functions. I can multiply any function of that type by a constant and get another of those type of functions. So this f are functions that we're sort of using as our model form a vector space. That's what enfranchises linear algebra to answer the questions that we're about to answer. So what we'll do is we'll do the naive thing to do. If I wanted to 
actually find a function that passes through all three of these points, what I would do is I would take these three points and I would just plug them into my function. Let's see what happens. Um, already I think that my work is going to be irritating because my x, one of my x's is 2, which doesn't have a very nice square root. Um, so I'm going to have my work cut out for me here, unfortunately. But let's plug in our three points. 0, 1. If I plug that in, I'll get an equation that looks like 1 is equal to c1 times the square root of 0 plus c2 times 2 to the 0. If I plug in 1, 1, I'll get a similar equation, except my x values are going to be 1s plus c2 times 2 to the 1. <coughs> and then my third point, 2, 3, I'm going to get 3 equals c1 times the square root of 2 plus c2 times 2 to the power 2. So I want to leave that as it is for just a moment for you to absorb it, but I want to simplify it in just a second. The goal here is to figure out what c1 and c2 are going to make all three of these equations simultaneously true. Let me take this moment now to simplify. My c2 coefficients are 2 to the 0, which is 1. Uh, whoops, c2. 2 to the first power, which is 2. So 2c2. Two two. And 2 to the second power, which is 4. 4c2. Four uh, my c1 coefficients are going to be square root of 0, which is 0. So my first equation just becomes 1 equals c2. Um, 1 times c1. And then the square root of 2 times c1. But what you notice is that I end up with a system of equations, three equations, but only two unknowns, c1 and c2. So what do you expect, what does linear algebra tell you about the nature of the solution of this system? When we have one of these over-specified systems, what tends to happen? We have two, yeah, when we have too many equations for our variables, our number of variables, to be able to satisfy, we're asking too much of poor c1 and c2. Chances are, because we have too many equations, chances are this is not going to have a solution. It's going to be inconsistent. Right? Um, but we kind of expected that. Because if this were actually a consistent system, there would be one of my goofy functions that would exactly pass through all of these three points, which is actually a whole lot to ask of uh, this particular function, um, because it's going to be very hard to make it go through 0, 1, um, unless, unless the square root of x, eh, I don't know, maybe it could go. Well, that's the thing, right? Um, if we were to try to solve the system exactly, we would be mandated to have C1, sorry, C2 equal to 1. And if C2 were equal to 1, then C1 plus 2 would have to equal 1. So C1 would have to be negative 1. So the first two set of equations would come out to have the solution C2 equals 1, C1 equals minus 1. But you'll notice that that pair definitely does not satisfy the third equation. So clearly, this is an inconsistent system. We can't satisfy all three of these equations at once. So what do we do? We do the best that we can, right? Just like anywhere else so far in our course, we can do the best we can in solving. Let me make this into a matrix equation here. Um, so our matrix is going to be, uh, let's see, what's my first column? 0, 1, square root of 2. My second column was 1, 2, 4. By the way, you'll notice that where these columns actually came from is that they were the evaluations of the function square root of x evaluated at my three x values, x equals 0, 1, and 2. That became my first column. Similarly, my second column is the other basic function, 2 to the x, evaluated, again, at the same points, x equals 0, 1, and 2. So we can see kind of where this matrix came from. It came from evaluating our basis functions at the x values of the points that are in our data, right? 0, 1, and 2 in, in my example. And then that matrix is multiplying my two coefficients. So I have this coefficient vector that I'm trying to solve for. And then over here, the right-hand side is 1, 1, 3. Well, what are those? Where did those numbers come from? Yeah, these are just our y-coordinates of my data points.
Okay? So this is a repeatable process. Whatever our function model happens to be, we end up at the same spot where we have this linear system of equations whose matrix is gotten by having the columns equal to the evaluation of our basic functions at the x values that are in our data, and the right-hand side of the equation just being the y-coordinates of those data points. And we have to somehow come up with a solution for this. But a solution is probably not going to exist because the system is overspecified. Um, today, we give no, uh, names to these various matrices. We call this matrix F. It's the evaluation of our functions at the various places. We call this vector here C, or a vector of coefficients that we're trying to solve for. And then this thing over here on the right, we'll just call capital Y. Just giving them colorful names today um, because it ties them to where they actually came from. <clears throat> okay, so if I can't solve the system FC equals Y, what was the underhanded trick that we did on the first Math Material Monday of the semester to try and turn something which has no solution into something which has a solution? What was the sleight of hand here? Here's a hint. I want to multiply by something on both sides. Yeah, I'm going to multiply by F transpose on the left, on the right. And this new equation will have a solution provided what? What had to be true about F in order for this new thing to actually work? Remember, it's the, the one condition that we have here in order to make F transpose F, which is going to uh, be our new square matrix on the left-hand side, that needs to be invertible in order for us to solve this. And that matrix is invertible when what is true about F? When the determinant of F transpose F is not 0. But that's going to happen when some condition on the columns of F. The columns are independent, exactly. So this is fine as long as the columns are independent. If the columns of F are independent. By the way, looking at our two columns, are they? Yes. yes. How, do you, how can you tell? Yeah, we only have two columns, and so the only way for them to be dependent is for one of them to be a multiple of the other, and clearly that doesn't happen here because one of them has a zero where the other does not, for example. Um, okay, great. So we know that even though we couldn't solve our original system, we will be able to solve F transpose FC is equal to F transpose Y. So let's do that and see where that gets us. So I'm just going to take and multiply on the left, on both sides of my equation here by F transpose. There's 0, 1, radical 2, 1, 2, 4. And then I also have to multiply on this side by that same thing. 0, 1, radical 2, uh, 1, 2, 4. And my right-hand side, again, was 1, 1, 3. That was my y. So let me do my right-hand side. Uh, I'll have 1 plus 3 radical 2 will be my first entry. 1 plus 3 radical 2. My second entry, whoops, will be 1 plus 2, which is 3, plus 4 times 3 is 12, so 15, I think. 12 plus 2 plus 1, yeah, 15. All right, so there's my new right-hand side. Uh, and on my left-hand side, I'm going to have to write this over off to the side. I'm going to have a 2 by 2 matrix. Um, first entry is going to be 1 plus 2 is 3. Next entry is going to be 0 times 1 plus 1 times 2 is 2 plus 4 square root of 2. That will also be the bottom left entry. 2 plus 4 radical 2, and then the last 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 4 squared, that's 16, plus 4, which is, is 21. All right, so I get kind of a nasty matrix. And this is my fault for lack of foresight, because I insisted on having that square root function be in here. So I'm going to have to pay the price on that one. None of you will have anything quite so...
nasty. 3, 2 plus 4 radical 2, 2 plus 4 radical 2, 21. And then C1, C2. And you can check that that matrix, that purple matrix there, which is F transpose F, um, does not have a zero determinant, and therefore we can invert it, and we can solve for C1 and C2. So I'm just going to do that. Uh, this is going to look nasty. So the inverse of that matrix will be 1 over the determinant, which will be 63 minus quantity 2 plus 4 radical 2 squared. Yeah. Um, and then we'll multiply that by, what's the trick? Flip the diagonal, 21, 3, put minuses off the diagonal, so minus 2, minus 4, radical 2, minus 2, minus 4, radical 2. And then I'll multiply that by our vector over there. So when all of the dust settles, um, what I end up with in my example is this vector, this coefficient vector, which we said was C1, C2. So in other words, my equation of best fit should be y equals minus 1.088 times the square root of x plus 1.11098 times 2 to the x. That that is the function from among my library of functions that I'm working with, which most closely passes by the three points that I'm using. Um, let's see how close I got. So it is minus 1.08 minus 1 and then 1.11. 1 um, and in my applet, how close did I get? Uh, 1.16 and 0 0.28. So I probably could have done considerably better um, than I actually did here. So let's try it. If I zing this back to negative 1.11, or negative 1.08, I think it was, right? And put this forward to 1.11. Uh, oh, yeah, look at how much better <laughs> the actual version does um, than the one that I chose. So clearly, yeah, there we go. Clearly, the, the method itself um, does a whole lot better um, than you might expect uh, to be able to do just by sort of sliding some sliders at random. Um, so your task for the remainder of the hour today um, is to employ this least squares method. So it's called least squares because you're minimizing the total amount of squared error between the data points and the curve that you're manipulating around. Um, and see how close your guesstimated numerical throwing stuff up at the wall and seeing what sticks gets to the exact answer. <laughs>